Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the fourth episode of Wolf School Season 2. Um, we'll give it a little about a minute to let everyone arrive and settle into the space. If you're calling in from YouTube, you can use the chat function to participate in this talk today. So as you sign in here, please let us know where you're calling in from, um, whose ancestral territory you are on right now. It's always really interesting to hear where folks are situated when they join our webinars. And for those of you who are tuning in um, for the first time, welcome. My name is Chelsea and I work with Raincoast Conservation Foundation. And for those of you that have been tuning in um, to Wolf School over the past month, we're so happy to have you back. And if you missed any of the first three episodes of this season, you can find the recording on Raincoast YouTube channel, which is where you are currently watching from now if you're watching live. Um, you can also find our first season of Wolf School on this channel or on our website at the URL below. All right, well, we've got some folks in the audience. Let me see here. We've got people calling in from Michigan, Alaska, Gabriola Island in BC, New York, Toronto, Alaska. Great. So happy to have you here. Um, and again, feel free to use the chat as you come in, but we're gonna get started. So to everyone who's watching, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, again, my name is Chelsea Greer. I am of English and Scottish descent. And as a settler in Canada, I just wanna start by first expressing my gratitude and appreci appreciation to be working, living, and talking to all of you from the shared unceded territories of the tsleil Squamish, and Musqueam peoples, also known as the city of Vancouver. And I want to welcome all of you to make your own land acknowledgements in the chat box if you haven't already done so. Um, so I work for Raincoast Conservation Foundation as director of our wolf conservation program. And this is our fourth class of the second season of Wolf School. For those of you who are new to Raincoast, we are a charitable nonprofit organization made up of a team of scientists and conservationists who are empowered by our research to protect the lands, waters and wildlife of coastal British Columbia in Canada. And I just wanna take a moment to thank everyone who has supported our work, specifically our WOLF program over the years and for all of your generosity over the course of this series. Um, your support is critical to our work and it helps um, make series like WOLF School possible. And your donations also help support our scientific research. And although Rancos work is focused on the conservation of wolves in British Columbia, we care deeply about wolves in our neighboring provinces and countries and around the world. So with this series and specifically our episode today, we wanna to provide you with the opportunity to learn more about wolves and the great work that scientists are doing to further our understanding about these uh, important predators. So again, audience members are tuning in today using YouTube. Um, you can participate by entering any questions you might have into the chat on this platform. And I'll be monitoring the chat throughout the session and I'll collect as many questions as possible. Um, so I can pose those to our guest speaker after her presentation. And lastly, Wolf School is, or Raincoast is running Wolf School with um, the Wolf Conservation Center in collaboration with them. And if you missed our episode last week with them, you can watch the recording on our YouTube channel to learn more about the ethics of captivity for conservation, as well as the return of Mexican gray wolves to the wild. So a big thank you to them and thank you to our colleagues at Raincoast and for everyone that's been sharing information about Wolf School. We really appreciate that. Okay, so now it is my privilege to introduce our guest speaker today, Dr. Shelley Alexander. Welcome. Um, Shelley is a professor in the Department of Geography at the University of Calgary and has over 30 years of experience researching human wildlife conflict. Specializing in wolves and coyotes, um, Shelley founded the Canid Conservation Science Lab, which uses non-invasive methods and embraces the principles of compassionate conservation. In 2015, she launched the Foothills Coyote Initiative, or Coyote Initiative, which explored landowners' situational experiences and worldviews relative to their perceptions, beliefs, sentiments, and actions towards coyotes. Shelley is the scientific director for campus wildlife management overseeing U Calgary Living with Wildlife, which is an active evidence-based program that integrates intensive field monitoring, 
outreach education, collaborative enforcement of human activity and adversion conditioning to realize human coyote coexistence. And in 2020, Shelley was awarded with the inaugural Applied Ethics Fellowship at the Calgary Institute for Humanities, where she explored the intersection of animal ethics, wildlife um, jurisprudence, and colonial ideology in relation to the treatment of pest species. And Shelley serves on many international nonprofit boards and provides expert review for communities facing coexistent challenges worldwide. So welcome, Shelley. And fun fact to everyone, Shelley was actually my supervisor for my graduate studies. Thanks, Chelsea. Shall I yeah, start so my presentation now? Yeah. So I'll add it to the stream here. Are we good? So I can still see the full. Um, okay. Full there we go. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Okay. I'm going to pop out and take it away. Okay, well, thank you everybody for joining tonight. I, uh, I am coming to you tonight from the traditional territories of the people of Treaty 7. Uh, and the city of Calgary in the area where I live is also home to Métis uh, Nation Region 3 of Alberta. So tonight I want to, uh, we're going to cover a fair number of topics. Uh, and I want to start by just talking about what I see us doing tonight is remembering telos. And telos is a term that was is uh, attributed to Aristotle. And what it is about is that all biological beings, whether that be a tree or an animal um, or a human uh, animal, have a purpose. And what Aristotle argued was that um, maintaining that or supporting that telos and allowing that animal or being to realize that telos is both good and ethical. And so I wanna be kind of tying back to that as I go through the talk tonight. And the second uh, quote on the, the first slide here is, that, is by uh, David Hume. And that is that no truth appears to me more evident than the beast are endowed with thought and reason as well as men. And the reason why I find this interesting is because when you look at the date, it's 1878. And he wasn't alone in these, this uh, way of thinking about animals. There were many other philosophers uh, arguing the same thing at this time. And I think what I find interesting about it is that including this, the, those people also included Darwin, is that here we are 150 years, almost 150 years later, and we're grappling with these questions about what is humane to do to animals or not. And instead of progressing from 1878 onwards and earlier onwards, we've actually regressed in um, our understanding of the needs of certain animals, including wildlife, and, in the, and, and we knowingly use methods that cause suffering. And so, one of the things I found in the research that I've done is worldviews and uh, personal identity and economies are really tied up in the use of these particular methods that cause harm. And because of that, what we find is when people, uh, once even uh, us as scientists, come forward with these ideas questioning the use of these methods in contemporary science, we are often met with uh, sort of defensive reactions uh, about, about that. And so we may be told something like um, ethics and philosophy have no, no place in um, objective science. And so our position is diminished. And that's kind of what I want to talk a little bit about tonight. So why does this harm persist in the methods that we use? This is related to the Applied Ethics Fellowship that I uh, undertook over the last year. And so what I found was that there was really sort of a nexus of things that came together. One of them was colonial ideology and the laws that follow from this. And we'll probably talk more about this during the question period. Uh, so I won't go into detail here. But the second part was really scientism. And that's something that um, 
arose in around the 1920s in related, relation to a particular scientist named Watson. Uh, and scientism was coined later as the idea of science is in love with itself and its own, its own purpose. And one of the things that scientism, the tenets of scientism is that only measurable things should be studied. Those are the only things that are valuable. And animal emotions or other emotions, the machinations within our head, those are not measurable things. And so technically they don't exist and they're not objective, uh, they're not objective measurable. Uh, data. And the other thing that came from scientism was that good science only considers the measurable. So we start to have a value associated with that. And then when we translate that to contemporary times, we still see with wildlife research, there's a pressure to conform to that belief that really overtook uh, the way that we did science and the way we interacted with animals. And while we do have systems in place like the animal care committees that can review the processes that we use when we do research. Um, those only apply in fairly narrow, uh, narrow realms like in academia. And when you enter the field, you can actually end up in a situation where you have a lot of self-policing. There can be a lack of reporting of the injuries that might occur in those situations. And sometimes people will just say, well, we're familiar with this technique and that's why we use it. The problem is that when we're living in that world, we perpetuate the oppression and violence that, um, that comes along with this. And so I want to argue that just because we can by law and we can because it's worked before, it doesn't mean that we should. And in fact, what we need to do now, I think, is move forward with our wildlife science methods and ethics and bringing those together and reconciling those. And when we want to do that, it means that we have to start to think about animal ethics. And when we do that, we have to think about animal and recognize animal subjectivity and agency. That is the heart of animal ethics. So how do we start realizing that in methods? Well, fortunately, uh, we're, we, we're pretty much there because we are animals. And so we have the capacity for limbic resonance. So we could use human analogs to understand and predict what kind of suffering we should expect those animals to go through when we use particular methods. We share the same brain structure and emotions. And the research shows that if people don't have to have a high level of training to understand, we just resonate with animals. And that's why we're so good at communicating them with them. And so we can use that as our sort of first check of what, whether we should use a method or not. The second way that I think we can tackle this is what I call immersive resonance. And this is changing the way we do our research. Um, and instead of doing remote types of research, move back in a sense to the original way of doing research, do in-depth research where we're, we're observing those animals at a distance or invoke in integrating new tools like cameras, non-invasive approaches, and we alter our positionality. So we start to experience what is it like to be that animal? We discover, experience, and we integrate those multi-species capacities into how we're interpreting that data and how we're understanding what the needs of that animal are and bring those back to inform how we do our methods. In this, we have to innovate. We have to remember what it's like to be an animal. We have to get down into the field. And one of the things that does arise is you really have to work to deflect the critiques about being biased when you do this kind of thing. There's sort of an argument that if you um, look at the world and interpret the world this way, that you have a value system you're bringing to this, that you're, you're biased science, scientist, which is, um, wholly untrue, but you have to be able to push back on this because it is a standard argument. So I want to move on to when we're trying to understand these things, this notion of not everything that counts can be counted. So moving away from this idea of the objective measurable, I want to tell a couple of stories to sort of illustrate that there are things that we haven't figured out how we're going to measure. So I want to start with the story of Diane. And this was the first one, of the uh, first wolf I had the privilege of working with. And I was studying uh, with Dr. Paul Paquette in Banff National Park. 
And uh, Diane was the matriarch of the of the Banff Bull Valley uh, wolf family. And in 1991, when I started, she'd actually just been outcast from the family. And so she was living uh, 100 to 200 kilometers away from where she had originally had her family, had her family and pups. And her daughter had then moved into the position of being the matriarch. And uh, shortly after the time when she would have given birth, and you, you, we know that by doing the field studies, we sort of see the localization of behavior, uh, localization of activity in one area. Um, she was actually found dead on the highway. And based on estimates uh, and the fact that she was lactating, uh, we knew that there were pups present in the area and that they would have been uh, at an age that they couldn't have been eating solid food. And so there was a, they were at high risk of, um, of dying as a result of her death on the highway near the, the den. What was amazing is that Diane, her mother, was over 200 kilometers away at the time and she returned within 48 hours of the death of her daughter to that site. And a few weeks later, we found we saw the pups, we observed the pups, and the pup's survival then suggested to us that Diane had actually spontaneously lactated. And that's not so much the surprising part. The question to me, and I think to all of us, was how did she know? She was so far away when this incident happened. I have a second story that I'll bring to you from Africa, from Zimbabwe, with painted wolves. And this animal's name is BK. And so BK was the uh, breeding male, the lead male for the family that lived approximately 10 kilometers south of where I was staying. And one of the challenges with painted dogs, painted wolves in uh, Africa is that they figured out how to use roads to optimize their hunting, but also to travel. And so uh, as a result, they, they get struck on the roads more regularly now. Um, and so of course, this is exactly what happened. We were preparing to head into Wangi National Park to look for uh, a new family of, of painted dogs that had been reported. There were 19 animals. And so at about 6 a.m. in the morning, we were, we were just about to roll out into the park and we got a phone call, a distressed phone call from a vehicle that was traveling uh, quickly down the highway from 10 kilometers south of where we were. And they reported that they had the dead, uh, sorry, they had a, a struck uh, painted dog in the vehicle with them, that it was still alive, but it would need emergency treatment. We're in the middle really of, of nowhere with very primitive um, facility to deal with something like that. But we drove towards the, the uh, we, we converged onto the rescue center uh, at about the same time and BK was unloaded from the back of the truck um, and into an enclosure. And um, amazingly, he was still mobile, but you know, not drugged, uh, but not really too reactive. And we worked with him for a while. And after about an hour, he started to raise his head there were significant injuries that suggested that he wasn't going to make it, but he started to raise his head and move part of his body. And everybody uh, stepped back and, uh, you know, this was actually seen to be a positive sign that maybe he was, he was rallying and he was going to come around. And so we decided we would step away and let him start to recover. And suddenly we realized what his head was raising for was suddenly we heard the sound of his family. And his family had been at the side of the road when he was struck. And the sounds they make is a small, what we call a who call. And it's a who, who, who. And the sound grew louder. And we stepped, we continued to step back a bit. And then his family emerged from the forest towards the enclosure where he was laying. And so we left, he got up. He, he struggled to the back of the enclosure and he lay at the fence line where his family approached him. And um, he, he didn't survive. But I think what was interesting to me about this was that, that, that BK had been brought from approximately 10 kilometers away 
in a vehicle at 100 kilometers an hour, and his family found him within an hour. So how did they do that? So you can write these things off as chance, but something is going on with respect to communication that I think we don't understand and don't know how to measure. And the reason why I don't think that we can write it off to chance is we took a day to sort of recover from this situation because these are endangered species and when you lose one, then you've lost the family, uh, its reproductive capacity. So we waited and we had one more night before we headed back into the park. And on the last night, we could hear coming across the savanna a vehicle that we didn't recognize. And you can hear in Africa the sounds coming from a long ways away. And the vehicle rolled in and they pushed out a dead dog, a dead painted dog onto the, um, onto the driveway. And immediately, Greg, the researcher who was responsible for these animals, recognized her as one of the sisters from 15 kilometers north, a different group. And there were just two animals. And so what that meant was that her sister was left alone, which is, is the end for that animal. Uh, very likely the end for that animal because they need to have family to be able to survive. And so we covered the dog up and we retreated into get sleep so we could head out the next day. And within an hour, we heard the sounds of her sister. And she came and she circled the camp all night calling to her sister. So again, how did she know? What are the things we don't understand? And I think it's important that we start to think about those. Sometimes we use our human perception as the measure as to what, what we should be looking for. And I think some of these things may be outside of our perceptive capacity. So that moves us on to capacities and telos. And I believe that those underscore our ethical responsibility to animals. And I'll use prairie wolf or canis, canis latrans as an entry point to talk about this. So some of you may not know, but coyotes are actually referred to as prairie wolves. So they do fit within the wolf, um, the wolf uh, talk here. Um, and these are from research that I've done uh, over the last five years with this particular family of, of coyotes. And so some of the capacities that coyotes share with all social um, canids are social intelligence. I see evidence of monogamy and alloparenting. So that means more than one parent, just like people. And monogamy, they live together for their lives and are not separated unless uh, one of the partners died. And what's, what's interesting about this as well is during the reproductive period, the male and female will, will be spending all their time together and so you'll never see them more than two minutes apart. Incredibly bonded. This is one of the puppies from that family. They all have individual personalities. We see evidence that they have language, both vocal and also uh, behavioral gestures. Also seeing evidence of forethought because this mother here is telling her pup, do not follow me further than this. Meaning she has intention to return and wants her pup to be alive when she gets there. And they also adapt this type of communication and they adapt their problem solving to different um, challenges that they face. I'll see, I've also seen evidence of joy and kin recognition. So just like when people come home to their puppies, uh, there's this huge amount of excitement when the parents come home to see the pups. You see evidence of imitation and joint attention. And here what you see is the pup is replicating what the father is looking at. And these are measures by which when we look at human development and the development of mind in, in children and in humans is joint attention is one of the key features. And that is a recognition that the other person that you are with when they look or point that has meaning. So it's a recognition that you understand that that person has a mind separate from you. And I also see evidence of fear and pain, which I don't wanna, uh, I'm not showing you slides with respect to that, 
But all of these capacities together reaffirm that these animals do have a telos. They do have a purpose. They do have lives and experience. And in all of the work that I've been doing in the last five years, uh, I've found that working with that telos rather than against it is really the most effective way for us to understand and coexist with these animals. And I want to close by just saying that I do believe strongly we need to extract our research methods and management from the colonial mesh that right now is embedded in. And with that, I will finish off the lecture just to say thank you, uh, uh, immense gratitude to uh, Dr. Paul Paquette, Jenny Ryan, uh, both of, of who uh, spent countless hours helping me learn about wolves and coyotes and wolf and coyote themselves. And I believe also tonight I have my supervisor, uh, Dr. Nigel Waters, um, tuning in as well. So I would like to uh, thank him and express my gratitude for his time. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Shelley. That was amazing. I mean, those stories are just just hearing all those um, stories of, you know, the senses that and communication that wolves and other canid species might use that we'll just maybe never understand. And I guess a good thing, good way to start off might be, you know, when you've talked about using the human perspective, but maybe, you know, that can limit our understanding of these animals and shifting towards trying to understand the animal perspective. And so I want to talk a little bit about the term habitat. Um, I know in your work, you've challenged the traditional concept of habitat by applying a, an animal sentience perspective. Um, so I, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how you would define habitat. Yeah, I, I think, you know, historically we looked at habitat really more as um, a two-dimensional sort of uh, scene, a map that has spatial dimensions to it and it has resources in it, like there's food, there's shelter. Uh, and I think when I, it, when I think about habitat for, um, for wolves or for coyotes, there's also an effective landscape that's there. There's, there's, there's two things. There's a cognitive landscape that is layered on top of that, which is how do I navigate that based on my experiences in this area? And the second is this effective layer of how do I navigate that sa safely? And um, so I think habitat also has for animals, um, it, it represents a value to them, a history to them. And because what you see is that they return to the same areas, there's an affinity to return to particular areas, not just so that they can raise their young, but perhaps there's areas they go where they know there's toys, where they know they have, um, you can tell they just sit there and they observe the view around them. So there's an experience of this landscape that is different than the traditional idea of it just being a resource base. You know, how do I, you know, where do I move through and where do I get something to eat? There's an emotional attachment to that landscape. Um, and I would also say that, you know, one of the ways I, when I try to understand uh, how, how an animal might be in a specific location that I go to or a new place that I go to, um, I think about it in terms of what if I were trying to navigate this space and stay safe. So I think that a lot of their world is about negotiating or avoiding the risky situations that might they might get themselves into. And this would be particularly when they're in contact with people, right? And so how am I going to get through this landscape safely? Uh, I don't think that's 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 far from from how people. Uh, negotiate the landscape as well. So uh, hopefully that answers that fully enough, but it's just, there is there there are other layers of meaning to this landscape than our traditional um, a, a way of thinking about it, uh, our, our Western traditional way of thinking about it. Uh, like us, they have affinity to places. There is meaning in those places. Yeah, and how do you think, um, like when we think of two, the environment that they're experiencing, you know, it's not the same as it once was decades or centuries mm -hmm. ago. Um, 
you know, we're experiencing mass, we're experiencing massive habitat loss. And so how does the science of animal sentience help us understand the consequences of habitat alteration and loss for these animals? I think we just, we need to think more broadly than simply there's an area, a, an area or a space that's lost, or there's a larger distance between those. There's, 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 a landscape of fear that's created for some of those species and for, for social carnivores like like wolves um, or coyotes, there's a landscape of fear that's created that is part of that landscape loss and that landscape change. Um, so, um, and so this, this, I think the science of animal sentience helps us think about that landscape more from the perspective of how, how would that affect us if we were living in that landscape, us as, as humans, if we're living in that landscape? Um, so, for example, we've talked about um, in, that, in, in one of the chapters that I wrote with Paul, is that if we start to think about what would it be like to be a human living um, uh, under those kinds of pressures where your house, your home was constantly being um, disturbed and you have to renegotiate that and figure out where are the waypoints? Where are the touchstones? How do I how do I protect my family within that landscape? How do I get the resources that I need? So, I think that the the animal sentience takes us into that to start to recognize that their responses to that are going to be like humans under significant stressors like that. And we don't have to you know it, it, humans under un, under siege uh, or in in war torn uh, countries experiencing those things. Those are analogs for what what uh, what wild animals are experiencing when we are destroying their habitats. Yeah, and there's a few questions coming in too, I think about, I think I wanna ask you this first question and it will lead well into um, a question that Deborah has asked. But I know that you've been you're studying wolves for you know 20 plus years and the methods of study have changed and progressed quite a bit over that time so i'm wondering if you could share a little bit about your past experiences using more invasive conventional techniques for studying wolves and how that's informed your work and methods that you use now okay so i'm moving the camera a bit because i'm because i'm getting like sprites on oh, my face yeah. um, of course the sun is setting as we do this so um yeah you know i think it was a progression and i think many of many scientists um prior to my generation and my generation you know have, have gone through that where tra the traditional methods that we used early on were the lakeful traps and and putting the radio colors on and so um my early experience with that uh, was with the, with the wolves, but the wolves were, were already radio colored, and I had a couple of a couple of um, encounters with you know wolves that we were radio coloring, uh, and so experiences that I drew from that, which I'll comment on in a moment, uh, and then uh, experiences with handling coyotes uh, that had been trapped for similar pur purposes for lake hold uh, or with lake holds for radio coloring, and. Um, you know, at the time, the 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 logic was that one is suffering, um, the few are suffering for the many for understanding, and I think there was a time and place for those particular questions, um, and that you know our ethic has progressed from there, where 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 those questions, the kinds of questions we need to ask now can actually be done with non-invasive methods. But so through that process of handling the animals, um, I saw the injuries that are sustained. Uh, and so, you know, not just not just the um, surface ish, the surface injuries that the animal sustains, but very significant um, injuries to to limbs um, and also very at times negative effects to the drugs that were being used. And so when you watch an animal struggle like that, you start to think about what is, how should we really be doing this to this animal? And, and are we gaining enough from our understanding 
uh, about or are we gaining enough in terms of understanding to be subjecting these individuals to this kind of suffering? And I think our position has moved on that. Many scientists are still using that, but I think with the evidence that's come forward uh, since that time, we know that there are long-term lasting effects of using the, the chemical immobilization on those animals. And so it changes the bar as to whether you should be using those. Personally, I think we come to you know our own our own place with it. We negotiate, you know, what is what is acceptable for for us and for what we understand that animal suffering to be. Uh, and for me, it evolved into something I just I was unable to consider putting an individual animal into those stressor that kind of stressful situation, not just because of the physical but because of the other things we weren't and we still don't pay attention to very well, which is the, uh, the emotional or the mental effects of being restrained. And, you know, we, we, we understood that, I think, I think we still don't understand that very well, but if we go to the human analog, again, to understand the consequence of being immobilized and restrained like that, uh, you can you can understand easily how that could result in trauma uh, and how that could um, have very traumatic effects and potentially uh, long lasting effects like like post-traumatic stress. And so I think when I look at it from that lens, I think combining the potential for physical, you might be able to mitigate that a bit. But when you combine that, for me, it becomes and it became um, something I wasn't willing to pursue anymore. And so I moved into just completely non-invasive methods and compassion into the con compassionate conservation realm. Yeah, that's really interesting. And with Deborah's question, cause I think you'll have a good answer to this too, because as a professor, you know, you teach a lot of this in your courses, but she's kind of wondering how we untangle our current approach to teaching new students from these, kind of archaic, unethical methods to a new approach with um, Telos in mind, with kind of what you were talking about in your presentation, that animal perspective. Yeah, so so how do we teach our new generation of students? Is that what the question yeah. is? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, I, I think we're changing this in, in um, you know, for me, I just I just teach through example. I, I explain the well, one, the ethics of it, but two, providing the evidence of how we can reach the same end goal by doing something that is less invasive for the animal. So uh, whether it's, and, and, sorry, and, and in fact, in some cases with non-invasive approaches, we can actually gain more. So I would say, for example, with the, the coyotes that I study right now, if I were to radio call that color them, I would only, I would understand where they move, how frequently they move there, um, but I wouldn't be getting those fine scale understanding of the behaviors that are happening in those specific locations. And it's those behaviors that are invisible to us when we use a, a remote tent technique like that, that are actually what's driving how they're making sense of that world and how they're negotiating it. And so I think in some cases it's it's more powerful to use a non-invasive approach, say like cameras. You have to be sensitive about how you use those cameras. Of course, not to, you can still intrude on their space. So you have to be very careful about that. It takes a lot more legwork um, to do that kind of work. So I think I explain through example, I teach through you know exposing students to um, the, uh, the literature on um, the negative effects of using certain invasive te techniques. And I think everyone has to come to this place. We can't force them to come to this place as students. We give them, we give them the tools to come to that conclusion themselves as to what they're willing to do. And one of the other ways that I deal with this is to invert the perspective. So to have them, um, and I borrowed this actually from a friend who is uh, a wildlife vet who teaches, who instructs on chemical immobilization, but 
who has, you know, to have the students right from the perspective of that animal. So what, what would, what would I want you to do to me if I am? And so you reposition, you, you, you put, have the student reposition themselves to realize that, that the animal has a way of thinking about what's happening to it and has, and, and you, so then you're bringing your own lens through the eyes of the, the animal, if that makes sense. And so the, I think that's, I don't, I don't actually, the students that, come, that I work with, are, the students that I work with in the classes are all very um, interested in approaching the world that way. I think the larger challenge is um, pushing the scientific community towards this different paradigm. And so that's, a uh, you know, again, by leading by example and by um, not, not allowing uh, yourself to be um, pushed off the good path by um, criticism. Yeah, and I think this leads, I think this leads well into this next question, um, just talking about getting your students to think about the perspective of the animal. Um, so when you are studying coyotes or wolves, um, maybe I'll first read this. I love this quote from the chapter that you and Paul wrote, um, that the same world can and does seem very different to a wolf compared to a human. Wolves see just fine, but communicate experience and think about their environment primarily through olfaction, a world that is difficult for us to imagine. And so keeping that in mind, like how might you approach studying a coyote or a wolf given how they perceive the world? Well, obviously, obviously we can't, we can't get ourselves into that olfactory sense, but uh, you know, I, I think we use different, for me, I think about having to explore that landscape and do that research in a way that we can start to understand I guess the combination of senses that might be being used. So for example, whether it's, you, and I, I know you you do this as well, but use the auditory, uh, use the um, acoustic devices to see if there's a connection between vocalizations that are being used and the, the, the meaning of that landscape. Um, I try to see it from their perspective. Like I, I try to get to the ground, I, I move where they move. Um, I follow their paths and I repeat follow their paths. And I think in, 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 um, in, in when you're in, in, in an urban environment like I am, uh, it's a little bit different, uh, but I use the same te techniques outside, but uh, outside of the urban area, but um, you have the opportunity to engage more frequently with animals in that, in that context and see how they rethink their way through um, challenges that are put in front of them. So um, those are the, that's the way I, I think about it is getting, getting down to, to the level and experiencing that world. I do use smell. I would obviously never smell the world the way they do. But when I am engaged in, in, in research and tracking, um, I, I use I, 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 I use my sense of smell um, to determine, you know, I, I can detect when they're around. Uh, and so we, you, you have to, I think, hone those. And I turn all senses on. If, if I were to do what I do when I track in, in an in a human centered environment, like in the city, if I, if I didn't shut those off, it would be too much information. But when I do wildlife research, I have all of those on sight, sound, the smell to the best that I can, every sensation to try to feel that landscape. And so, um, that's how, that's how I view how we get there to the best of our ability. Cause we only have so much. Uh, that we can work with and then bringing in um other non-invasive techniques like i talked about the acoustics and stuff like that so yeah and you touched on this a little bit already too but i i just loved when we talked previously um what you had said about 
being on the landscape. I mean, you, you utilize camera trapping and snow tracking. Um, yeah. So I kind of wanted to hear a little bit about um, the kind of information that you can gather through these methods. You had said it's like a theater piece playing out on this right. landscape, which I absolutely loved. Um, and how that can like change the perspectives of when others learn about what's going on. Cause this is like oh, when you're yeah. tracking coyotes on campus yeah. and there's yeah. a whole other world going on. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think that's to me you, in, in Banff, it used to be amazing to be out tracking and, and watching the vehicles like flying down the trans Canada highway. And, and here I am, I'm like completely engrossed in this, in, in really a theater performance. There's a Martin moving over here uh, and it's dragging something along that it's caught. There's a wolf that's gone through here. There's a lynx family. And it's all, it's all just playing out on this landscape of snow. And, um, and, and so in snow like that, that's where you see it, it the landscape comes to life. Um, and, and really, I think in summertime, I, I, I experience it similarly, but of course we don't see the same kinds of evidence. You're looking, you find scat, you find, you find a path, a narrow path through the grass, and you start to see it coming together. Um, and so, <laughs> so to me, it's a richer way to, to be in the world, to be seeing that. Um, and one of the things that I find is that, and I just taught a class on this, a community course on this, um, continuing education and, and people, it, it changes the way they see that landscape. So until your eyes are open, you don't realize that, you know, every day you're living with these animals moving around you all the time and their lives are playing out. And once they're awakened to that, I will receive, you know, I receive emails saying, I, I can't believe how differently I see the University of Calgary campus now, now that we went tracking across there. Now I know what, and, and, I, and I will walk people through the path that the mother had to take to, to move her eight babies um, two kilometers across and across busy roads and past the Starbucks, right? And, and, and say what, you know, how to, to imagine what that would feel like if, if, if you had your own eight, your own eight children that you were trying to herd down the road through that, you know, let alone be a wild animal doing that. So, so, so when they feel that and see that, it changes that perspective of, of the landscape. It's alive, right? When before it was background. Yeah. And I guess in your work too, can you speak a bit to the importance of, um, I mean, you've talked about knowing the landscape, but also knowing the inv individuals. And mm. I know that there's a really interesting story too that you have of one of the breeding males in um, one of the Banff family groups, which I think is a great oh. example of this, but just like what we can, yeah, the importance of knowing just not just population level, pack level, but also yeah. individuals. Yeah, yeah so the, 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 the story you were, you're referring to is, um, uh, there was a family of wolves uh, that used that that the the highway was twinned and there was a, an overpass under or sorry underpass structures put in on the first section of the twinning. This was a long time ago, and the the family that that of wolves that used that 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 it enabled them to access other points of their home range. Um, used that up until the time that the male. The, uh, the breeding male was killed um, on the highway. And uh, after that, the loss of that individual changed their, their movement. They, the family would not move across the highway anymore. Not because it, the, the death hadn't happened at that point, but they wouldn't use those underpass anymore. And so that individual, that loss of that individual changed the capacity of those animals as a family to use all of the resources that they once had. So that reconfigured uh, their whole, um, you know, their whole lives really. Yeah, and, and we know like, I mean, depending on the age of that individual, um, their place in the pack, 
you know, there's older non-breeding wolves that play a really important yeah. role in those family groups. And could you talk a little bit about um, the importance of elders and knowledge keepers within those coyote and wolf yeah. families? You know, this is really interesting. And I, 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 I don't know as much about it with the elders, with, with the wolves. Um, I mean, other than, than having an elder in that family, what their role is, is, is the keeper of that knowledge and the keeper of the knowledge about where the resources are, where to stay away from, um, you know, how to survive. They've, they've managed to survive. Where I have the most experience with that is watching this with the um, coyote families over the last um, five years. And uh, the ones that are most intact have an elder and that elder, it, it has, well, it's, it's clear they come in and at certain points in time, they come in and they take the pups, they take small cohorts of the family of pups off on foray. And so they are the ones that have that knowledge that, uh, and, and teach those pups, not in, and the parents do too, but these elders are instrumental in the transfer of that knowledge and the, and, and instrumental in other ways. So I will see one of the families that I, I study. Um, I would say the auntie, the, the auntie or the, the grandmother, whatever she is, um, is probably about 11. And for an animal that would, for an um, urban, peri-urban uh, coyote, that's, that's old uh, to live that old. Their average age is about three. So she's got a lot of knowledge and she's in there early on prepping the den for her daughter or whoever it is, her granddaughter, wh whomever she is related to that is coming back. She gets in there and tidies up the den um, that they're gonna use. And then she is at, at it at the at the entrance, fuss, 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 fussing after her her after the the uh, breeding female goes in to have the pops. And so there's all um, there's you know I can't all we can do is observe you know and look at it through sort of an ethnographic lens. But if we were looking at humans doing the same thing, we would describe these behaviors, right, as as caregiving and preparation and being part of the birthing process. And, and that's what I see the, the elder female doing. The elder male in one of the other families is he, he takes the pops in these rotations. Um, and I think those kinds of roles are critical, especially where they're trying to navigate human disturbance. And so when you pull, you know, unknowingly rip out these individuals and just think of them as, oh, well, we're just killing one coyote or we're just killing one wolf. They may, they, they all have important roles to play, but they may be the vital knowledge keeper um, or they, you know, they may be the glue like with BK, the painted dog that holds that whole family together. Yeah, and this might just be more of a comment because I think, um, you know, this, you kind of already answered this, but just in case um, folks aren't aware, you know, it's similar in the US too, but in BC and Alberta and across North America, um, thousands of wolves, of wolves and coyotes are legally and illegally hunted, trapped and killed. I mean, it's an estimated half a million coyotes that are killed every year in the US, and that's one per minute. Um, so that kind of, I guess, I don't know if you want have anything else to add to that, but that kind of, you know, the indiscriminately removing individuals from their packs. Right. I mean, what you right. just talked about. Right. So I think it, it 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 filters back into two different things. One is when we think about doing research and that we can, you know, sacrifice the one for the many. Well, we have to be thinking about <laughs> how does that play out with respect to the structure and the the stability of the family that lives there. Um, and, and so there's, there's the research methods part that we have to think about there and, and are our, our, our assumptions correct when we take that kind of utilitarian viewpoint? I don't think they are because they are not all equal, right? They are not all 
they're not just widgets in place. And so the second part is the management part is that, you know, the idea that, you know, it doesn't really matter. There's just numbers, right? Um, but they're not. Each one has a vital role. And so if, if for example, you remove, and, and it's with all the social carnivores, all the social canids, it's the same. If you remove um, those, the, those who exert the social structure, the controls on reproduction, and have um, the the knowledge to share with the younger generations, you cre- you know you create chaos. You create a situation in which um, animals may become prone to predating on livestock, or pr- prone to um, becoming food conditioned, uh, or they in order to recover they drop the reproductive age right to to start breeding earlier because they can because there's no social constraints so when we think about and that research is out there that shows that when you know it's 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 not strictly a numbers game um, at all it that because they have these social systems uh, in place that control and regulate the um, reproduction when you uh, tear that apart you create chaos when you kill the the father of um, a, a female, uh, you know the father of, and and leave the mother to pr- pr- um, uh, to procure food for the pups that are in the den that she's supposed to be um, nursing. Uh, you you place that whole family at risk, and you the, you 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 create a system in which there is more um, chance that there's going to be conflict because that animal is starts to struggle. So the individual thing is it's vital and has been a major missing part. And that's the stuff I'm talking about in, in terms of the, the, the colonial getting us out of this colonial web of thinking about these animals as not having a capacity to think, not having a capacity to experience the world. And that they're all sort of like the same. They are societies, they are families, they are societies, they are cultures. Um, and you know, it, it's, it, I think it's, it's a narrow view. It's a narrow worldview that we have adopted. Um, and there are many other worldviews that don't, don't share that perspective, uh, that we do in the Western science. So. Yeah. And I mean, we're getting close to time now, but I think it would be nice to end on, you know, I think a lot of people that are here today care a lot about coexistence and would I would love you to share, you know, what would your advice be to them of like how they can be involved in conservation and coexistence more broadly, but also within their communities if they live alongside wolves and coyotes? Well, I think, you know, that's a big question um, for a short p- period of time, but I think the number one thing that I find is education. And so um, understanding, you know, getting getting the education and understanding how to engage with those animals in a way that protects them from learning how to do the wrong thing, because canids are canids. They, we, 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 we teach them um, to do the right and, and wrong thing. And so learning what is it that helps keep them doing what they need to do, keeps them living that purpose, um, allows them to live that purpose and, and allows them to avoid interacting with us. So learning those and, and getting involved in education and outreach programs, that is for me the number one thing where I see I can get traction um, in terms of people. People feel empowered. They stop being frightened and realize that these situations are not always, you know, and, or not they're they're rarely, if ever, dangerous situations. So, um, and that that people have control over the trajectory of that. And so, education and outreach is a big one. The other thing I think is absolutely critical right now is engagement, figuring out how to engage in the legal process and the the changing of the designation of species and the changing of the laws that allow this kind of indiscriminate killing to happen. Um, Because we know it doesn't work. 
right? We have the science to show that it doesn't work. And so we're still, and yet we're still engaging in it. And so without the pressure, there are, there are groups around who are voices for the public, um, but also just exercising, you know, your, your own voice in that um, to make change, uh, I think is, is a big one. So hopefully that's enough advice to, to, to go around for now. Yeah, that's great. And yeah, we're at time right now, but I think that was a really great piece to finish on. So I just want to thank everyone, um, our audience, um, for taking the time to join us tonight and for all the thoughtful comments and questions. Um, a lot were coming in, being very appreciative of your talk and your um, answers, Shelley. And Shelley, thank you so much for all the time and effort you've put into tonight. It was truly amazing to hear all of the amazing stories that you shared. And if you want to learn more about all the amazing work that um, Shelly does. You can follow her on Instagram at canid underscore lab. And then if you're interested in learning more about wolf conservation, um, please stay tuned for the rest of the series. Um, folks might be wondering when the next episode will be. We have three additional classes in the works for you. Pending our guest speaker's internet connection, the next class is tentatively planned for two weeks from now on April 18th with Yellowstone Wolf research, researcher and author, Rick McIntyre. So please keep an eye out for an email with updates on that. Um, and then you can also visit the Wolf Conservation Center in person or at nywolf.org. Um, you can also visit uh, the raincoast.org website to find out more information on wolves. Um, and with that, is there any final words that you want to leave our audience with, Shelley? I just want to say thank you, everybody, for uh, for coming out tonight. And, and thank you, Chelsea uh, and Rain Coast, for the opportunity to be here tonight. Great. Thank you, everyone, and have a good night. Goodbye. <laughs>